good evening ladies and gentlemen it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this let's webinar series of webinars organized by majan university college it's my privilege to introduce you to the speaker of today's session dr paul sant who is currently the head of the school of computer science and technology at university of bedfordshire uk Dr Paul is a chartered IT professional of British Computer Society Dr Paul is an always a research active and his research interest includes graph theory bioinformatics trust modeling security modeling in the pervasive environment computer security and forensics recently he is much concentrating on the blockchain and its implementation Dr Paul has published variety of publications in reputed peer reviewed journals and is also supervising of course supervised many scholars who are popular in their field of study all credit goes to Dr Paul Dr Paul is also teaching in the MSc computer science course that is being offered in Majan University College with the association of University of Bedfordshire without further delay i would like to invite Dr Paul to take over the session Thank you, audience, for having uh, joining the session, and uh, have a good evening and enjoy the session. Over to you, Dr. Paul. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, hopefully, everybody is able to see my screen. And salam alaikum and good evening across the world. Uh, welcome to my session today, which over the next thirty minutes or so aims to give you an introduction and an overview of blockchain technology to look at the idea of secure communication and to view and see uh, applications through for example the internet of things so i'll be sharing my screen with a presentation and then moving in and out of that screen hopefully you can all see uh, my screen now yep okay so blockchain is a really exciting communication approach and it's one of the most well-known and well-used techniques that can be used across the world Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to my talk today on blockchain, a secure form of communication. Salam alaikum uh, and welcome to you across the world. And what I'm looking at providing an overview of today is the notion of blockchain. But I want to really start my talk by giving a very historical overview of security more broadly so blockchain is one of the newest technologies it's not by any means the only technology that is out there in terms of uh, secure communication there are others for example ethereum which is one of the most well-known competitors but prior to all of this secure communication has been with us for a long long time and when i say a long time i'm not just talking a few decades I'm talking a few millennia. So for example, in the ancient world, secure forms of communication involved shaving people's head, writing a message on somebody's head and allowing their hair to grow back before asking them to go on a long journey and to be able at the other end to have their hair shaved. So a very simplistic form of communication, but for many years, a secure one. If we think about other technologies, cryptography that we're going to take a look at today is the basis of many secure communication protocols and that itself whilst many of you might think of the internet and uh, algorithms such as for example uh, the re revest Shamir Edelman or RSA algorithm that uh, underpins many of today's communications including for uh, for example the transport layer security that we use uh, in transactions through things like, for example, uh, HTTPS secure. 
However, we didn't start off with RSA. That wasn't the, the foundations. The foundations date back to Roman times, where we, for example, have one of the most simple uh, what we call the Caesar ciphers, whereby we just shift our alphabet by three characters in order to create our scrambled message. So in terms of what we're going to look at today, we're going to look at uh, the new and emerging field, but just keep in your mind the fact that the ideas and the concepts that blockchain are built on are ancient. Um, and then while they have changed over time, uh, and become more secure and more complex as technology has moved forwards. Some of the principles on which they are built uh, really outline the foundations of mathematics. So without further ado, let me now move on through to my second slide. Which is around blockchain. So what is blockchain and why is it important? Well, it's a form of communication that can be used to uh, record and transfer currency, property, and other objects across the internet. So as the name suggests, it creates or consists of a series of blocks. And those blocks are nothing more than transactions between people, organizations, software, machines, etc. Some of those transactions may involve uh, money, for example, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency being uh, transmitted between different users. However, what's different about blockchain is it is distributed. That is... Um, there is no single central server, and you can consider it as a peer-to-peer -peer network. So as we see here on the blockchain diagram, whilst these are blocks that represent transactions, for the moment, just think about these as representing computers and all of these computers being connected together. So whenever we perform a transaction, we're not going through a central server we have what we call a distributed ledger. And that distributed ledger contains all of the transactions that have been undertaken since that blockchain was started. Now, there are many applications of blockchain. So we've already had a hint at one of them. That is transactions of cryptocurrency. So, for example, if you want to transfer money from one person to another, you can do so using, uh, for example, the most popular cryptocurrency Bitcoin, and you can transfer those Bitcoin between uh, different users. And so our blockchain is essentially a historical record of all the transactions that have taken place. And the great thing about blockchain is it is very secure, and it is what we call immutable. And we'll see why it's immutable later on, but just for now, in essence, the immutability means that if a transaction is appeared and is validated on our blockchain, then if we were to try and make any changes to that moving forwards, those would be rejected because we use what we call validators that would check all the previous transactions in the blockchain against our current transaction and realize that there was a change. Uh, and we'll see how we can detect that change as we move later on. And blockchain is important because it provides a really, really secure way of performing transactions, be they monetary transactions, be they transactions of um, property, for example, or sharing of contracts. And really, blockchain is built upon cryptography. It's built upon the idea of keys. It's built upon the notion, as we'll see later, of public key cryptography. Uh, and whilst we don't necessarily refer to things as being public and private keys, we might call them wallets and private keys, for example. Nonetheless, it is the cryptographic pairs of keys that allow us to securely transact Bitcoin property 
or any other form of object that we wish to share. And if we're thinking about how this works, um, essentially it works because the protocols and the cryptographic approaches that we use nowadays are very, very secure. They're secure because they are built on keys of large size, and they're secure because it's very, very difficult to work out the private key, even if you are given somebody's public key. So even if you have information about a public transaction, you're not able, under current computational resources, to reverse engineer the private key. So whilst we make the public key available for anybody who wants to make that transaction, it's the private key that allows us the power in blockchain and the power in cryptography more broadly. Uh, what we tend to do in blockchain is rather than referring to um, private keys per se, we refer to what we call a hash function. And hash functions are important because they allow us to validate large transactions. So if you imagine these chains of blocks, each block could contain tens, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of transactions that are all put together in one block. If each of those transactions takes up a number of, let's say, for example, let, let's be uh, kind, a number of kilobytes, we can imagine in order to be able to check each and every one of those transactions bit by bit in the computer, that would take a long time. By using hash functions and hash values, we can actually validate things very, very quickly. And we'll see more about that later on. And what I want to say here in terms of its importance is it's not just important because lots of people nowadays use cryptocurrency and trade in cryptocurrency. Indeed, it's possible to buy a house using cryptocurrency nowadays. It's very much about the Internet of Things. Things like this, which I hope you'll be able to see, uh, and if not, then we'll show it at the end. This is an example of a temperature sensor, taking the current temperature in my house at the moment. Now, you might not think any or anything of it. That's just like a thermometer, you might say. Well, yes, that's true. But when I combine it with my mobile phone, for example, and again, hopefully you are able to see here, uh, but if not, we'll do a demonstration at the end. You're able to collect data. I'm able to connect my temperature sensor to the internet. I'm able to share my data with others. So, for example, you could imagine me wanting to be able to share or transact my data, for example, through blockchain uh, and being able to make sure that that's secure. So I may want to share it for global warming purposes, for example. Or I may just want to share it uh, for the sake of being able to analyze data, create dashboards, and generate an entrepreneurial product, for example, that I could use in order to uh, generate money, create new business, etc. Okay, so public key cryptography and blockchain. Well, in blockchain technology, in order for us to perform a transaction, we, needed, we need to have created what we call a wallet. And a wallet essentially allows us to keep bitcoins and also to transfer bitcoins from one wallet to another user who also has a wallet. And essentially, all in technical terms, our wallets are, are what we call random looking strings of letters and numbers. So instead of you being able to see on blockchain, um, one of the things you do need to be aware of on blockchain is that the, the distributed ledger is public. So everybody can see all of the transactions in the blockchain. However, what they are not able to see is they are not able to see your personal details. So they can't see your name, they can't see your address, they can't see your telephone number. They just see a random identifier but that random identifier is unique to you and that is in essence the wallet that you have so you would appear on a distributed ledger your wallet if you performed a transaction as that random string of numbers so nobody could tie that back to you 
So that gives us an element of security, which is useful uh, because, of course, if we're thinking about transact transacting over the internet or we're thinking about transacting over peer-to-peer -peer networks, one of the things that we need to be aware of is that whilst we might be a bona fide person and completely legal, there may be other users on that blockchain who are potentially there for illegal uh, activity. And so we don't want them to be able to find out personal information. Uh, so for example, how much Bitcoin, how many Bitcoins we have, or our personal information that could allow them to track back uh, and locate us in the world. Okay, the other thing that blockchain makes use of is this notion of a private key. So and if we want to perform a transaction, and we'll see an example of a transaction later on, we need a private key in order to be able to do that. So the sender of a transaction needs to add what we call a digital signature, um, which is their private key. And that's added to the transaction. And the reason for that is to make sure that we can verify um, that the person who sent that transaction is um, a valid user. Because one of the things we have to think about is where we have a centralized network, it is very easy for us to think about um, being able to verify or authenticate transactions. Where we've got this idea of a distributed network or a peer-to-peer -peer network with no single authority, we need to make sure that when we send our transaction from Alice to Bob, and we'll see an example uh, in a little bit, we want to make sure, or Bob wants to make sure, as the receiver of that transaction, that nothing has happened to it when it was sent across the blockchain, when that transaction was made across the internet. So the private key provides us that element of security. It provides us with that check, uh, and it makes sure that blockchain works effectively. So I mentioned Alice and Bob, and I mentioned this notion of transactions on a blockchain. So what do we have to do in order to perform a transaction? Apologies. I should be able to go back. Okay, so we've got Alice and Bob here. So Alice here is our sender, and Bob is our receiver. In order for Alice to perform a transaction with Bob, then Alice needs to create a message. And the message is the blue box here with the red parts in it. The first thing we need to know is we need to create addresses for Alice and Bob so that they can identify themselves. So this is your wallet. This is where the information is coming from and where the information needs to go through and go to. So in terms of our message, the message is fairly simple. It has the address of the sender and the address of the receiver. In this case, the address of the sender is address Alice, and the address of the receiver is address Bob. Very much like we do on a email, where we have a sender address and a receiver address. We then need to define, in our case, we're using blockchain for a financial transaction, an amount that we are going to transfer, any change from that amount, um, and a transaction fee. So sometimes uh, there may be a transaction fee that is um, attached uh, to uh, performance of that transaction, because remember, uh, we do have certain overheads. We also, in our message, have the private key and the public key of Alice. Um, we add the private key and send the Bitcoin, sign our message as we did before, and we send that across to Bob. And Bob is the only person then with his private key who can then perform further transactions. So if Bob is then providing a similar transaction uh, to Peter or to Pauline, then uh, he would then carry on the process in the same way. And these, these transactions link together 
And once the transactions in a block are completed, then we can uh, create a new block, for example, for a new set of transactions. But we link all of these transactions together. And the reason that we link the transactions together is so that we can have that immutability, so that we can check when Bob receives, for example, that transaction, that nothing has happened. There's been no change to those transactions along the way. If there has been a change, then that transaction would not have been validated. We have the validators, uh, by val a validator. And we have this idea of um, our validator being able to check and make sure that the hash value in the current transaction matches the hash values of all the other transactions and we're able to do that because when we send our message we attach a hash of the previous blocks transaction plus our transaction along with it so the receiver can then perform a check or the validator can perform a check and make sure that nothing has changed and we'll see why and how that can work shortly. So you might be asking, is it really that simple? Can we really just send and receive information just like that? In broad terms, the answer is yes. But in reality, from technical terms, there are some things that we need to be able and we need to be aware of. So I mentioned before this idea of a distributed ledger. Once a transaction is performed and validated, it is entered upon the distributed ledger. And so that distributed ledger is essentially our history of all the transactions. And it's this piece of technology that is really, really important for us because we can't alter that ledger. That ledger essentially is like carving our transaction in stone. Any changes will be very, very visible. Any changes will be catastrophic, not necessarily that things will uh, break, but in terms of the person who made those changes that wasn't authorized to do so, their changes won't be validated. They won't move forwards. Apologies, my screen keeps uh, dropping out. I'm not quite sure why that's happening. So blockchain is decentralized. There is this idea of a distributed ledger. Everybody has a copy. Um, there is no single authority. Everybody essentially is working in a peer-to-peer -peer network. The other thing for us to think about is at the moment, I've talked about one transaction in a block. There could be millions of transactions in a block. So your transaction is only one part of it. However, it's an important part because it goes together when we create our hash value to making a significant contribution to that hash value. Blockchain uses a concept, as we'll see in a little while, of what we call Merkle trees, which are essentially combinations of hashes, which at the lower level have each of our individual transactions. And we then take pairs of those transactions and take a hash of those, uh, the, ha the pair of hash values and so on. And we go up to our Mer Merkle tree. So at the top of that Merkle tree, we have a hash value of all the transactions within that tree. And that's why it's important. That's why the distributed ledger is important. And the Merkle tree is fundamental to that because it gives us the hash value of all the transactions in our block. And it's that hash value of all the transactions in our previous block, so that Merkle root, as we call it, that gets sent to the next block in our blockchain. And it's that that we can use to keep validating and making sure our distributed ledger always has an accurate record of any transactions. So no transactions will ever be missed out and no bogus transactions can ever be entered onto our uh, blockchain. So these transactions are immutable. 
So the fact that they've happened, the fact that they have been validated, means that nobody can then dispute the fact that they took part in that transaction. And we can always track back to the first block. So we're able always to validate everything back to that first block and the beginning of time. And if there were to be any changes, then a transaction would be denied. So a validator that checks before a transaction goes through is essentially the party that makes sure there are no changes in that hash value as it's been transmitted. If values do not match, a transaction does not take place. And so it's important, therefore, for us to look at hash functions. And essentially, a hash function will take a message of any length and create a fixed length, what we call hash value. And you can see an example on the screen here. So here I've got an example that is a message that I've written that says this message that I would like to prevent being changed. I use a hash function to create a digital signature or a hash value. I attach the hash value to the message and I send it. The receiver can calculate the hash value of the message they've received, compare it to the digital signature, and if they match, the message is genuine. If they don't match, it is bogus. And so we've got an example here. So, you know, there's probably 150 characters there that we could then create a hash value of, let's say, to, uh, let's say 20 characters. Now, in reality, we've probably got messages that are several thousand characters or several thousand bits. And we create, for example, a 256 bit hash value. So taking millions of bits down to 256 bits means that checking and validating on a hash value is much quicker. And so that's an added advantage of black blockchain, being able to use these Merkle roots or these hash values of blocks means it's very quick to validate and verify and make sure that nothing has been changed. The other thing about hash functions is that they are very difficult to reverse engineer. That means if I give you a hash value, so for example, a hash value that you see on the slide here, it would be very, if I just gave you that hash value, it would be very difficult for you to work back all the way to uncover the original message. So that means that they are um, very important from a security perspective. And the other thing for us to notice is that if we change a single bit in our input message, the output message is vastly different. So if I change the bit in my message here, so for example, imagine there is a man in the middle attack. So I am Paul, I want to send to Alice, and Bob is my uh, sniffer on the network. Imagine now that Bob has a way of reverse engineering this hash value. And he manages to get the value that we see uh, in the message here. He manages to get the plain text. If he changes a word, for example, I would like to allow changes to this message, and then ran that through the same hash function, for example, SHA-256, it would generate a completely different hash value. Why is that important? Well, even if he sent this, the original digital signature would still be attached. So I would create the hash of this message that has been changed, and it would generate a completely different hash value. So when I compared it to my digital signature over here, the two values would be different, and I would then detect that there was something not right. And blockchain, uh, sorry, hash functions have applications way beyond blockchain. They've been used for many years. For example, they can be used to attach a digital signature to a message. They can be used as message authentication codes, for example. Um, and so blockchain as a technology is new. But the building blocks of, or some of the building blocks of blockchain are not new. However, 
why reinvent the wheel when you can depend upon hash functions like, for example, SHA-256. So what does the Merkle tree do for us? Well, it allows us to validate our transactions. So the Merkle tree is used, as it says on the slide, in order to ensure that transactions on the blockchain are valid. So you see at the top of this diagram four transactions, transaction A, transaction B, transaction C, and transaction D. Now, for each of those transactions, we would create what we call the hash value. So we've got then four different hash values at the next level down in our tree. The next level, again, would be to take the hashes of A and B and to create a hash of the combination, and we call that hash AB. And equally, we do the same for CD and get a hash of CD. And then right at the top of our transaction, we get what we call the Merkle root, which essentially is the combination of the top two values, which in this case is hash AB and hash CD. So we create a single value. And it's this hash ABCD in the example here that we attach to our message when we perform a transaction. If something was changed along the way here, or changed at any point in any of our transactions, then the Merkle root hash value and the transaction that we were trying to perform would not be the same, and therefore we would identify an issue and stop that transaction going through. So the thing for us to remember, and I will reiterate again, is that a block can contain thousands or millions of transactions. So having that very short Merkle root hash value provides a very quick way of us validating what we have provided uh, and making sure that we can say, yes, absolutely everything is uh, as it should be. So we can verify that, question, uh, that transaction. You could have millions of transactions that you verify in milliseconds. Whereas you can imagine trying to take each individual hash and compare it would take a lot longer. So in the last seven minutes or so of the session that I'd like to talk about, I'd like to talk about how a blockchain can be used in the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is something that's developed over the last decade or so, so since about 2010, but it's based upon very old technology. So the Internet grew out of a project by the U.S. Department of Defense called DARPA uh, back in 1969. We then really didn't see the World Wide Web coming to the fore until the late 80s, early 90s, and that was really around the time that email started to pick up a little bit of transaction, uh, sorry, traction as a form of communication. But it's really over the last 30 years that we've seen so much development in the internet and really over the last 10 that we've seen things like for example these temperature monitors we can have doorbells for example that we can control with our mobile phone and allow people to drop off and pick up things without us being in the physical vicinity alarms uh, smart housing and lighting systems smart central heating systems for example uh, the Hive Hub that's used in the UK uh, by many utilities companies, including British Gas. So the Internet of Things really allows us to connect devices. And they don't just have to be temperature sensors. They can be mobile phones. They can be your smartwatch, for example, where you might use Strava to record data around your daily running. So the Internet of Things really is and refers to any device that can be connected to the internet, either via a wired connection or through, or likely, a wireless connection, 4G connection, uh, but typically a wireless connection. And there are many applications of things relating to the internet, including smart cities, be that being able to create smart infrastructure or simply being able to share data. And I'll show an example of that 
in the MK Smart project shortly. Or connecting the world. So it's not just your smartwatches, it's not just your everyday uh, personal user that uses the Internet of Things. There are power stations, nuclear power stations, and other aspects that are connected for remote access, for example. And so they also form part of the Internet of Things. And so we need a secure way of allowing, for example, a device to access. So this is where, for example, blockchain may come in. So as part of the induction process, the initiation process, we might, for example, uh, create a unique identifier for a thing or an object on the internet, a smart watch, a um, mobile phone, a smart temperature sensor, etc. And then when these things want to be able to communicate with each other, it's then that we can start to harness the power of blockchain using things like, for example, the notion of smart contracts. So what we've got here is an example of a project that I was involved in between 2014 and 2017 called MK Smart. Um, and MK Smart is a project that has now developed since 2017 into something we called City Labs, which is about generating dashboards and allowing people to share and trade data. So blockchain is an opportunity and application within the City Labs project. But the MK Smart project had three main pillars. It had the energy pillar, the transport pillar, and the water pillar. And the idea was to make Milton Keynes in the UK a smart city by connecting sensors that could collect data and be, by generating entrepreneurial opportunities for people to be able to tr trade in data. And so it's that that is the important part of the Internet of Things and where blockchain could be applied in those transactions where you want to be able to buy and sell data sets. Because those data sets, for example, again, could be particularly personal, they could be particularly beneficial from a business perspective. And so blockchain transactions and blockchain currency and the idea of smart contracts is where that would come to the fore. So we need a safe way to communicate. Of course, you could tell me, well, why don't we just use encrypted channels? Why don't we encrypt all of the data that's being sent across these communication channels? Why don't we just use uh, tried and tested public key cryptography? Well, there are many, many data breaches out there. I've mentioned two here, Equifax and Facebook, where millions of personal details and millions of different user records have been made available. All fees for illegal activity. Now, there are many other examples here, for example, WikiLeaks. And so we need something else in order to secure those transactions. And quite honestly, a lot of the approaches that we do today, um, you know, if we're going to move on to exchanging houses, property, then we're not just talking about one Bitcoin being transmitted. We're not talking about small amounts of money trading hands. We're potentially talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars or pounds or Armani, Armani Real or uh, Rupee or, or whatever your currency is being transacted. So we want to make sure that when those transactions are taking place, when those devices are communicating, that we have a secure way of doing so. And so this is where smart contracts come in, which essentially are protocols, uh, typically using uh, JSON format or an XML-based like format, where much like the message we had in blockchain for cryptocurrency transactions, we have similar setups. And this allows us to exchange currency, to buy and sell property, to buy and sell shares, and buy and sell essentially any goods that we can exchange. Now, the great thing about smart contracts, well, think about a contract generally. If you want to create a, uh, a contract between two parties, 
then typically you have to do that by engaging with a third party, typically a lawyer. Smart contracts do away with that. Smart contracts allow one individual to perform a exchange immediately with a second person or a second um, user. So it removes the need for lawyers. It removes the need for that third party. And a smart pro, uh, contract process can provide all of those verification. All of that verification that a lawyer typically does in terms of getting deeds for a property, in terms of uh, checking that you are the original owner of the property and you have the right to transact, all of this can be bundled up into the area of smart contracts. And of course, this isn't necessarily something that is only happening since the Internet of Things has developed, but it is something that has been happening more and more frequently as we move in to the area. And typically, software agents can take on and start to negotiate and share those contracts, so we don't necessarily even need to be a significant part of that process. We can actually ask them to perform those transactions on our behalf. And using technology like blockchain and like smart contracts allows us to be safe in the knowledge that if a software agent goes rogue and starts to change things for its own benefit or it gets hacked, we can be safe that those transactions won't be validated because we have the technology in place through blockchain in order to be able to verify those transactions and make sure we are only validating those transactions that are bona fide. And I think that we're going to see real developments. Indeed, we're already seeing real developments of this type of technology. But more broadly, I think we have applications of smart contracts in other areas, like, for example, artificial intelligence, where there are significant moves now for artificial intelligence helping lawyers and the idea of artificially intelligent decisions being made in and around uh, cases in courts of law. Trading, Bitcoin trading, stock exchange trading, but without the need, for example, for traders, all potentially made possible through the use of software agents. So I hope that's given you a little bit of insight into blockchain technology. Certainly, there's a lot more and a lot more technical detail that we could go into, but hopefully that's wet, wet your appetite. Uh, and just before I pass control to Jacintha, I just wanted to share with you um, a couple of really important resources if you wish to have a look into the technical detail. One is uh, blockchain.com which tells you all about the blockchain process and should you wish to do so, allows you to set up your own wallet. Um, but do take this note of concern. If you lose your wallet, if you lose your private key, you lose all of your Bitcoin, there's no way of being able to ever recover that. So that's just something to think about. And maybe for the budding researchers out there, for you to think about potentially how that one downside of blockchain might be overcome. I did mention that blockchain is not the only focus out there. Ethereum is a rival. And so, again, it's based very similar to um, the blockchain approach. Uh, so if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about that, then please feel free to have a look at ethereum.org. If you're interested in MK Smart and the MK Smart project, then you can access that through www.mksmart.org. You can find out about that and even go and view the, the successor to that, which is City Labs, and see what they are doing in and around the Internet of Things. I did also talk to you about the notion of the Hive Hub, which is a smartphone device that, again, is 
a further opportunity for you to be able to have a look. If you want to have a look, www.hivehome.com and you can see what the Hive Hub has to offer. Finally, and most importantly, uh, just to share with you the idea of the smart sensor here. So this is a smart temperature sensor. And there is a smartphone app then that you can use in order to be able to uh, see that. Sorry, it's probably not showing up so well on my screen at the moment. Uh, but there is a, an app called Eve that allows you uh, to collect your data. Uh, and then you can have lots of different automation processes going on in your house. For example, you can connect it to your uh, home hub and then use your temperature sensor to control whether you want to turn your heating on or off. I think I'm going to leave it there for the moment. There will be a chance for questions afterwards, uh, but I will uh, just stop sharing my screen and pass over the control to Jacintha. Uh, good evening, audience. I'm happy to introduce to you the MIFI programs offered at Mazan College in association with the University of Bedfordshire. We have MSc program with five pathways. The first one is MSc in Computer Security and Forensics. So if you want a career in the area of Computer Security and Network, security or forensics investigation. So this is the right pathway for you to opt for. The second pathway is MSc Computer Science in Information Management and Security. So if you would like to take up governance or compliance role within an organization or for those who are looking to take charge of data management, this is an apt pathway for you. The third one is MSc in Computer Science, Applied Computing and IT. So this pathway is uh, uh, helpful for those who want to apply information technology to their current career if they are not uh, currently into IT field. The next one is MSc Computer Science, Computer Networking. So although you would have done computer networking, networking at the undergraduate level, so at the master's level, you are provided with in-depth knowledge of both wired and wireless technology. And the last one is the computer science uh, with mobile computing. And this one is applicable for those who are looking for a career in wireless networking or mobile application development or looking to make a move from fixed to wireless networking technologies. So this is the overview of the pathways. And the general entry criteria is to enter into MSc course, you need to have minimum of 2.2 GPA or a good classification as well as IELTS 6.0 score and for an MSc course you need to study eight units each of it of 15 credits each and the project which is 60 credits. We have a very good uh, mode of study so it is a part-time mode in a blended learning format helping the working students as well as the students who live uh, far away from the college campus. So we have only five weekends uh, on campus with a distance, good distance between each class or each weekend and two online sessions for each semester. So why do you need to enroll with Majan for an MSc course? 
because Majan is the first private university, private uh, higher education college in Oman. And it is the first private higher education to get full accreditation from OAAA. And PJ Center is well versed in handling postgraduate students. Currently, we have above uh, 700 postgraduate students. And MSc Computer Science is a well established program, and we have been offering this since 2011. And units offered at the MSc courses are delivered with hands-on experience, with practical skills, and we have partnership with professional bodies that you can see it on the screen here. And we are delivering cutting-edge technological skills using these professional bodies. And if you are interested in MSc course, joining MSc course. Uh, at Majan, you can call the toll-free number you can provide it here, or you can email us at pg.admissions at majancollege.edu.om. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can put it in the chat box. I'll uh, hand over to Siddiq, who will speak about the undergraduate program. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sinta. This is Mama Siddiq here. Um, uh, can you please scroll to the next slide, Jacinta? Right. Uh, we have, with the faculty of IT in Majan College, we are offering uh, many BSc honors uh, computer science programs. Uh, you can see on your screen, we have a very uh, latest, first in Oman and unique kind of program, which is uh, computing in oil and gas. Uh, we have two different mode of delivery. One is a regular for uh, normal students, and the other one is for uh, the employees working in oil and gas sector. Um, we, we have both full-time and part-time. Uh, this program is especially for the people who are interested in oil and gas industry, and uh, they will have, again, hands-on experience with technologies such as CADA, wireless sensor networks, industrial computing, oil and gas, industrial computing, business processes, and industrial data networks. There are many job opportunities in the market with these programs that you can gain, like oil and gas network manager, SCADA system administrator, wireless network architect, sensor network administrator, and so on. And along with this, in the same program, we have other pathways like computing, software engineering, Okay, now this program is for those who, who wants to gain uh, hands-on experience in software development, concepts of software quality and quality models, standards and methodologies. We have a banking information system program also. Uh, this is for uh, those who can again uh, ana the analysis, formulating and implementing diverse IT solutions required in the banking sectors. Now again, there are so many banking uh, sector job opportunities available. Uh, they can get uh, like executives in banking, back-end operations, database designers, analysts, bank cashier, and so on. Then we have other program like uh, computer and internet application for those who wants to have a career in computing and internet technology and uh, the networking. Again, this is a very unique uh, program in Oman. Uh, and the very successful one, uh, it, it will help to design, create, operate, and maintain network infrastructure for both modern and distributed enterprise systems. We have a huge alumni in that, and uh, the kind of job opportunities in the markets are for network administrators, network system engineers, or let's say technicians, network programmers, analysts, uh, network system managers, van architect, and so on. This program is uh, available in both full-time and part-time. Uh, it, it, the Diploma in Higher Education uh, award is for three years and BSc honors is for four years. Uh, the course structure has 30 modules each, uh, module with 13 or 15 credit, and one technology project at the end of uh, the BSc honors, which is of 30 credits, so total of 480 credits. These are, all these programs are quite unique in nature. 
very innovative. The, you will gain a, a very industry hands-on experience into that. It's up-to-date curriculum design in consultations with industry experts and unique in title and content. Um, we also have uh, you know, academic partnerships with uh, industries uh, like Cisco Network Academy, Oracle, ISACA, Advanced HE membership also with the SAP uh, industry uh, and NSE Training Fortinet and Microsoft Academy. So a lot more details can be get can be taken from a Majan website. So uh, Jacinta, over to you. Thank you very much. If you have any question, please put that in the chat box. Uh, thank you, Sadek. I think Dr. Paul can take over for the questions. Thank you, Jacintha. Uh, thank you to everybody for listening. So I'm just going to go through uh, the questions that I can see, either those of you who listed questions, uh, but also to go through the chat in case anybody's used the chat windows. So the first question was uh, from Nabil around one of the key challenges being uncertainty in relation to regulation and regulatory frameworks. That's absolutely a great question. I think it's probably going to be the maker or the breaker in terms of wide-scale adoption of um, in terms of frameworks uh, and in terms of the adoption of blockchain. Uh, I think the other one is the competition between blockchain and other types of distributed ledger like Ethereum. Um, there's no silver bullet. Uh, people are going to have to come together and it's probably likely that the only way that you'll get wide-scale adoption is for the generation of a standard um, based in and around uh, those that have already been set up uh, so that it is a badge of recognition in terms of uh, generating wide-scale adoption. If people see that that is a standard that is adhered to then they will be more likely in order to be a, or more likely to uh, adopt more wide scale so in terms of the next question that i have here um, one of the questions was around uh, is it safe to trade with invisible bitcoins like anything else you really have to um, be careful about what it is that, and who it is that you are uh, transacting with. Um, probably in broad terms, I would say not really. Um, however, given the technology that sits behind blockchain, uh, you shouldn't be afraid with engaging in blockchain transactions as long as you follow the guidance and as long as um, you know you're not circumventing or trying to get around any of the rules. Um, in terms of applications, so I mentioned a couple of applications, obviously cryptocurrency, uh, trading and buying uh, objects or simply paying for things in Bitcoin is um, an opportunity. And uh, one of the other things that I didn't get a chance to, to mention at this point was around um, electronic electronic health records so there's a move now to having electronic health records online uh, and blockchain and one of the, my PhD students is looking at putting together a blockchain approach uh, to managing the transact or transmission of health records and sharing of health records and you having blockchain as the underpinning technology to make sure that those transactions are valid and that there is no unnecessary or illegal tampering with those electronic health records. Um, in terms of the question around uh, artificial intelligence uh, and whether artificial intelligence is used in hash functions, not generally. Uh, generally, we're just looking at uh, the broad mathematical basis um, of 
transferring a, a, a variable length message to a fixed, fixed length message. Um, okay, so there's a, a question here around uh, cybersecurity. Uh, that is something that we are working between the University of Bedfordshire and uh, Magian University College in terms of moving things forward uh, in and around that. Uh, so there, there will be hopefully uh, an announcement soon in terms of that pathway and how that will, will move forward. Um, in terms of uh, the, the question around uh, the BSC and Majan and the MSC oil and gas, um, I'll probably leave that to uh, Jacintha uh, and uh, perhaps to, to answer in and around that particular question. Okay, so there's a nice question here about uh, blockchain around edge computing uh, and the Internet of Things. Um, given that edge computing is, is a fairly new uh, discipline, um, I mean, blockchain is finding more and more applications, as I say, in terms of electronic health records. Um, I haven't seen that much uh, applications of blockchain with edge computing at the moment. However, that's probably because a lot of the research is in its early stages uh, moving forwards. Um, Yeah, so in terms of your transaction, um, essentially when you perform a transaction, then no personal details are, are transferred. So it's only you that knows that more broadly um, and senders and receivers can see the public record, but on the public record, they only see the transaction. They don't see, so they'll see your wallet ID, but they won't see know who that wallet belongs to. Uh, so there are no details shared at any time. Um, in terms of technologies required to adapt it into the banking sector, it's probably something that the banking, I mean, some, some banks already allow transactions in and around Bitcoin um, and, and blockchain. In terms of them being able to, to, to link that, then they need to obviously be able to adopt and set up their own blockchains. Uh, and there are many examples of out there in terms of platforms that have been built not necessarily in the banking sector, but in other sectors um, around use of blockchain. Uh, health is one of the biggest areas where it's being applied at the moment. In terms of costs, like anything, uh, the costs could be significant um, because, of course, we're looking at uh, blockchain in terms of commercial environments rather than um, public, uh, sorry, private individual environments. Uh, and so the costs will be fairly significant, but then again, um, the flexibility that this provides and um, the verification and, and the likely reduction in fraud may be something that the banking sector is willing to, to look at and think about. Um, in, in terms of the age limit to create a, a wallet in, in blockchain, there are verification purposes in place. Um, and so in essence, you've got to be able to buy and sell blockchain. You've got to be able to have transactions. So essentially, it's the, the minimum age limit um, is in and around uh, 18 years of age. Although, you know, if you have a bank bank account before that, then uh, there may be an opportunity to set up a wallet. But it's likely at that point to have um, a need for parental controls in and around that. Uh, there's another question here about uh, the oil and gas program. Um, I'll, again, I'll leave that, leave that to Jacintha and others. Um, around the infrastructure, um, you, I mean, you can you can build blockchains very very easily. They don't need huge amounts of uh, computing power. So, for example, a colleague at the University of Warwick, Dr. Gregory Epifaniu, who used to work with me at Bedfordshire, has built an infrastructure around blockchain using Raspberry Pis. So in terms of infrastructure, it can adapt. Um, the applications out there will run on multiple platforms. Um, and so I do believe that blockchain will be adapted to lots of different platforms as we move forward. 
Um, in terms of uh, email address, yes, I'm more than happy for that to be shared following the, the seminar in terms of uh, my email address and my contact details. Um, more than happy for, for that to be sent out uh, afterwards. Just going to, to check in the chat to see whether there are any questions in the chat. No qu questions so far. Uh, if I hand over just back to Jacintha and Mohammed uh, to say very briefly, uh, answer the questions about the oil and gas, and then pass back over to um, Armstrong, who will close the session. So uh, if I just share and hand control back to Jacintha. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, at the moment, we do not have MSc in oil and gas. Uh, however, uh, we could think about it in the near future because uh, we already have bachelors in oil and gas. So we may plan to offer it in the future. But at the moment, we do not have that pathway. Over to you, Armstrong. Thank you, Jacinta. Uh, that brings us to the end of this webinar. Uh, it was good to have over 70 participants participating in the webinar. Thank you for your participation and thank you for your interest. I also take this opportunity to thank Paul. Uh, this is a very busy time in the university, but he found time to be available for the seminar. Thank you for that. I also want to thank my colleagues who made this webinar possible, uh, Kumail, Roshan, and my academic colleagues as well. I want the participants to know that this is a part of series of webinars which are going to be available for you over the next month. So please look forward to them and we also look forward for your participation in this seminar. So it's time to bid bye for now. Good night and keep learning. Thank you.